in conversation with Blaise Aguirre y Arcas on the threat of technology that we can no longer control. And BJ Cummings with James Rasmussen and Paulina Lopez about the impact of the Duwamish River on our region. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain due to the event cancellations and the ever-changing landscape. We hope you will consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation by clicking the donate button at the bottom of your screen or becoming a member. You can make a donation online or check Town Hall to 44321 to give. Our partner booksellers have also been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak and can use your support as well. If you're interested in supporting local independent bookstores by purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight, please use the link in the live stream page to purchase through Third Place Books. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page, linked here in the chat. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The video will be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Tonight's presentation will be about 30 minutes, followed by Q&A. Rita will select the questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. You can also vote on which questions will be addressed by clicking the arrow next to the question to upload it. We cannot guarantee that we will be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the phone. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arno Matolsky Science Series is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, Wincoat Foundation Northwest, and the Taxpayers of Washington. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching today. Dr. Rita Caldwell is a pioneering microbiologist and the first woman to lead the National Science Foundation. She is a distinguished university professor at both the University of Maryland and John Hopkins University, John Hopkins University's Bloomberg School of Public Health. She is the author or co-author of 20 books and more than 800 scientific publications. Dr. Caldwell's book, A Lab of One's Own, One Woman's Personal Journey Through Sexism and Science, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rita Caldwell. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, this is I have to confess, this is the very first um, book event that I've ever participated in, so um, forgive me if I make any mistakes along the way. I also am very regretful that I can't be in Seattle because it's my own stomping ground, so to speak. I, I'm a graduate of the University of Washington, UW, and it would be great to be there. But in any case, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk with you about, about the book that um, has just come out. Uh, published by Simon & Schuster, A Lab of One's Own. <clears throat> this is a book that really started five years ago, but even before then, I had thought about writing a book. It's pretty daunting, really. Um, and I had been asked to um, uh, collaborate in a book um, before we got, um, Sharon McGrain, uh, Sharon Burch McGrain and I got, got involved in writing the book by a, a colleague uh, um, a male colleague at the University of Maryland. And I had asked my good friend, Claudia Dreyfus, who, who writes for the New York Times, if, if, um, if I should undertake the endeavor. And her reaction was, no, you really should work with someone who is a woman who would understand um, the issues that uh, you'll be writing about. So with my good fortune, I received a phone call from Sharon, who asked to write about cholera. And uh, I was pleased because I wanted to write about cholera anyway. But as we get started, it, it morphed into um, a book about women in science. And it turned out that many of the difficulties that I had had along the way seems that was pretty common. Other people, other women had gone through a lot of similar experiences. And so the book has uh, turned out to be a series of stories about various periods of time in my life uh, when I uh, was a young scientist, uh, began my work in Bangladesh um, on cholera. So I'd like to talk about that first, um, the issues surrounding the work on cholera. Um, actually, 
it begins really at the University of Washington when I uh, did a thesis with Dr. John Liston, who is retired now, a remarkable man, a Scotsman, um, lots of fun, good sense of humor, very, very smart. He had done a degree in biochemistry at Edinburgh University and a PhD in um, marine science at Aberdeen in Scotland. And he came to the University of Washington as a new young assistant professor uh, to uh, establish a new program in marine microbiology, a completely new field, of course. Today it's a very important one. So I had come to the University of Washington intending to go to medical school. I'd been accepted, but then received a letter saying that I could not enter uh, until I became a legal resident of the state. This was 50 years ago, so it's probably changed now. But in any case, I um, ended up working with John Liston on marine bacteria. And one of the things that I did was collect the microorganisms that you find associated with seawater, fish and shellfish and so forth, and accumulated huge numbers of cultures, a whole lab full. And I began trying to identify them and characterize them. And I ended up finding out that um, I needed new techniques. So I began using a lot of biochemical characteristics and encoding all this information, I really needed a computer. I had heard about Peter Sneath in England who had um, written a paper with um, Bob Sokol at the at, um, University in New York. And they had used a computer to analyze plants and animals uh, to develop taxonomy. Peter had suggested and had done some initial work on microorganisms. So I decided to um, use the computer. Now this is again, a long time ago. The computer had just arrived at the University of Washington, the IBM 650 um, in the attic of the chemistry building. Um, it was the only part of the building that was air conditioned, not because of people, but for the instrument. And we graduate students weren't allowed to use it except between midnight and 6 a.m. And uh, programming it uh, was entirely in machine language. Fortunately, my husband's uh, lab had a postdoc uh, colleague who had used computers uh, in industry when he uh, had worked before he came to the university. And so he showed me, he trained me actually, he, he helped me program the IBM 650. And when I tell you that um, the maximum uh, data that I could manage uh, on the IBM 650 were 40 microorganisms and 80 characteristics. Now, you know, that computer was the size of a refrigerator, a very big refrigerator, and it had uh, the computing capacity less than you would have in your watch. But it was a big deal in 1960, um, that's 60 years ago. And so I wrote the program and um, it worked to be very, very successful. And so that was how I ended up uh, in systematics, bio bioinformatics, and also developed, um, uh, at the time, DNA was becoming uh, understood. Uh, Watson and Crick in 1953, um, when I was still an undergraduate, had uh, uh, decoded the, uh, or actually had determined the structure of DNA, but of course, uh, they depended on a, uh, a, an X-ray crystallograph that Rosalind Franklin uh, had developed and used her data, her graphs, without her permission. She never did get credit, uh, did not participate in the Nobel Prize. And it wasn't until years later that um, uh, Jim Watson admitted that uh, the photographs were key to understanding 
the helical structure of DNA. So I developed the techniques as they were being uh, uh, discovered uh, at the time uh, of um, sequencing uh, and doing analyses to characterize microorganisms using DNA sequences. Now, I did a postdoc in Canada at the National Research Council. So I'm speaking to you today from Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I, I'm staying with my daughter, who is a physician at uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, uh, mainly to escape the heat of Washington, D.C. and Maryland, but also the COVID virus. They have had only about three cases of COVID-19 here in Halifax since January. Well, in any case, I did my postdoc at the National Research Council in Ottawa, Canada. Jack, uh, my husband, uh, was a physicist and he postdoc with Jim Morrison at the NRC and I worked with Norm Gibbons, who was a, a halophile specialist. He worked on bacteria that could only grow on salt or grew very, very well in saturation um, salt medium. Um, and the combination of my uh, being a marine microbiologist and Norm Gibbons working on halophiles allowed me to understand the structure and function of these kinds of microorganisms. And as it turned out, I ended up working on a group of microorganisms uh, called Vibrios. Now that was not exactly by design. Uh, it was sort of accidental because I had started out studying a bacterium, Pseudomonas, fancy name for a bacterium that produces a green pigment and can be very, very serious infection uh, under certain circumstances, but it's common in water, water systems. And I had written two or three papers on Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and I was invited to a meeting at Berkeley uh, hosted by Roger Stanier. And uh, when I was giving my talk, uh, Roger Stanier kept um, interrupting and talking over me and it was really embarrassing. Um, and I couldn't understand what the problem was. I thought the talk was pretty good, but it really turned me off from working on those bacteria. And it was the biggest favor that anyone could have done because I switched to Vibrios and they were far more interesting and um, turned out to be um, a mechanism for working on a very serious public health problem. So when I went to Canada, I worked on Vibrios and I made the discovery that the, the named species, the reference species was Vibrio cholera. So I'd gotten some strains of Vibrio cholera uh, that had been attenuated, meaning they had been modified and selected not to be highly pathogenic, but still representative uh, of the genus. And so I started working on Vibrios um, and discovered, because I had been working on marine bacteria at the University of Washington, that Vibrio cholera behaved just like all the other marine Vibrios. It is a, an aquatic bacterium. It turns out, as um, um, a, Dr. Singleton, one of my postdocs, proved by using very elegant um, techniques, the Vibrios have an absolute requirement for sodium chloride. Uh, it can be spared by the presence of divalent organ ions like magnesium and calcium, but for structural integrity, in other words, for the cell to stay up together, it needs some salt. So here is this pandemic causing bacterium turns out to be just a, an ordinary aquatic bacterium found in estuaries all around the world. Now, 
the medical folks did not agree with that. They had been taught, uh, medical doctors had been taught that cholera was caused by a bacterium that was transmitted from person to person. And so um, this was when I ran into the first of my difficulties. Uh, here I was, a young woman scientist, uh, breaking all the rules uh, of the science by saying that this bacterium was a naturally occurring bacterium. It was uh, related to marine bacteria. Um, and I made a further discovery along with my students when I moved from Canada, when Jack and I moved together uh, to Washington DC area, Jack um, got a position as a physicist at the, what was then the National Bureau of Standards and now National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. And I, um, through the good graces of my marine microbiologist friend, Dick Morita at Oregon State University, introduced me to the chairman of the biology department at Georgetown University, um, who hired me uh, on the spot when, when we talked at an American Society of Microbiology meeting. Uh, this happened 40 years ago. It doesn't happen that way today. There are all kinds of seminars and meetings and interviews and so forth. But there, it was simply chatting in the hallway of one of the hotels where the meetings were being held. And um, I told Dr. Chapman, the chairman of the department, that I was well-funded. I had an NSF and an NIH grant and had published several papers and had lots of work uh, to finish once I moved on from my postdoc. And George had just been hired as the chairman of the Department of Biology at Georgetown. And um, he had been given marching orders by the president of the university to bring in grant money, publish papers, and establish this uh, new department that had just moved into a brand new science building at Georgetown. And um, for George, it was perfect. So he and I shook hands, and I moved to uh, Georgetown in Washington. This was back in 1963. And at that time, I was invited to give a talk at the local chapter of the American Society of Microbiology. And there, sitting in the audience, was Dr. John Feely, a scientist at the NIH. And he said, you know, he said, if you're doing such interesting work with Vibrios, why don't you work with the real pathogenic forms? And I said, well, I don't have a lab at Georgetown for uh, very serious pathogens. Ah, he said, you don't have to worry about this one unless you plan to drink it, which of course I, I did not. And so he sent me um, a set of cultures. Um, I put them in the refrigerator because uh, I was pretty busy setting up the laboratory. And a week later, I took them out and I tried to grow them and they wouldn't grow. So I called John and uh, said, you know, these cultures, I guess, didn't survive trans, trans, uh, transport. Ah, uh, he said, you must have put them in the refrigerator. These bacteria are like bananas. They don't belong in the refrigerator, which was curious. Anyway, that was the beginning of a long uh, series of experiments showing that these bacteria went into a dormant stage. And I was able to show that they're associated uh, with plankton, zooplankton. And I'd like to show a few slides, just a few. Uh, so if you could put up a slide, um, that would be very helpful. The, um, the background um, of the uh, studies, um, as you can see up in the top left, there I am in a boat heading off to Bangladesh um, to do studies. Uh, because I, by the time I'd got started at, at Georgetown University, uh, I'd become really pretty well known for the work on Vibrios. Then I was invited to go to Bangladesh to work on cholera in Bangladesh, where it was uh, an epidemic every year. And so there I am with colleagues 
in a um, Boston whaler, which is essentially the transport boat, to go to the remote villages in Bangladesh. And um, the next slide shows um, the kind of environment in the remote villagers, uh, even today, where women collect water for the households. And um, it's at a site where people will be washing dishes, uh, washing vegetables for cooking, uh, brushing their teeth. And way off in the far corner would be the latrine. So this is um, an environment where cholera is endemic. And may have the next slide. So putting, to, putting together um, all of the information that I had learned over these 20, 30 years, the fact that the cholera bacterium is aquatic, the fact that it's associated with plankton, uh, and that it's seasonal in its, epid its epidemic form, led my colleague, Dr. Anwar Huck, we have the next slide, and I to develop a technique where we simply trained women to filter the water using sari cloth. We had done experiments in the lab first, where we had found that by using sari cloth as a, you know, the cloth that women use for their dress, we had tried men's t-shirt, yeah, that didn't work. Uh, it was too coarse. But folding this uh, sari cloth, in fact, we found that old used sari cloth was even better, about four to eight times, made a very nice mesh, um, a filter. And because the plankton and the particulate material would be trapped, the water that would go through might contain just a few bacteria, but others had shown that you needed to ingest or drink a million before you would actually get the stages of diarrhea that would lead to an out, a full-blown case of cholera. So we were funded by the National Institute of Nursing. We submitted it to the NIAID, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, but they didn't think it was sophisticated enough, so they lateraled it over to the Nursing Institute, for which we're very grateful. And so we trained women to go out into the field, and if I could have the next set of slides, just a couple more, to go out into the field and um, train the women of the households to take a piece of sari cloth, as you see there, fold it four times, put it over the collage, and then collect the water for the household by pouring the water through the folded sari cloth. Um, next slide shows that it was pretty obvious that uh, on the right-hand side is pretty clear. On the left-hand side is the pond water with all kinds of plankton and debris and, of course, bacteria. And so we did this study um, for a year, and the next slide shows that we were able to reduce cholera by 50% just using sari cloth. And uh, yeah, the, the next slide. Uh, what's very important is that safe water is still a global challenge uh, today. And I'm very happily working with the Safe Water Network, putting together the many groups that are working to provide safe water to uh, disadvantaged communities around the world, even in the United States and some of the reservations in the West, but it, also in South America. So by this simple technique, we're able to save many lives. So I think that's it for the slides. And what I'd like to do now is close by saying this, there's a whole lot more I could talk to you about. Anthrax, uh, when I was director of the National Science Foundation, it was when a young woman doctor developed breast cancer while she was overwintering in Antarctica and had to perform her own biopsy, uh, another interesting tale. Uh, but I'll close with that because there's a lot about my good fortune of having 
had a wonderful life, but also the similarities with so many other just terrific people uh, who it turned out shared some of the harassments, some of the, uh, how should I say, uh, blocks and challenges as I was pursuing my career. And I'd like to close by thanking my co-author, Sharon Birch McGrain. Uh, it's been an amazing five years. Um, she's uh, incredible in being able to gather all kinds of data and make sense of it. And uh, we were very successful in putting together the book. So with that, I'll just take some questions that you may have and hope that you'll find the story interesting. And for the young women, the last chapter are some suggestions of how to make your life a little easier so that you can be a very successful scientist as well. So, Megan, are there any questions or? Uh, Hi, uh, so I'm Shane from Town Hall, Seattle, and um, we invite you to submit your questions at this time using the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen there. And as, as a reminder, we ask that you keep your questions in the form of a question, so short and concise if you can. Um, so we do have a first question here. Unfortunately, I don't have a name tied to this, but they say, Dr. Colwell, thank you so much for sharing your story. What was one of the biggest challenges as a woman in science with leading so many international efforts? Culturally, it is difficult in the US, but also internationally. Uh, I, that's, a, that's a very important question. I think it's, it's mostly the series of small cuts. Uh, or as one of my colleagues said, a ton of feathers uh, is still a ton. Uh, and when you um, are constantly uh, being rebuffed and told that your idea is crazy, uh, and when your graduate students are taunted for working with you because your ideas are apparently crazy, uh, what you have to do, and what I always did was simply uh, take it on the chin and just keep on going. Because I knew that what I was doing was important. And I knew I could be successful uh, because I'd had the support from my father, from uh, John Liston, uh, from uh, my supervisor, uh, Norm Gibbons, and from George Chapman. There were some really good guys out there. And my husband, my husband, Jack Caldwell, whom I miss, uh, intensely. Uh, we were married for 62 very happy years. So there were people out there to help. But I think the biggest challenge was to persist um, and not give up or give in. Um, even when I would go to the Hill as the director of the National Science Foundation with my deputy, Joe Bodonia, who was wonderful. Um, he passed away last year. Joe and I got on really well. He was an engineer. But we'd go to the Hill, and the chairman of the committee, where I would be defending the budget, would direct the questions to Joe, like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm the director. He's the deputy. But Joe and I took it in stride. Um, so I think it's, it's having a sense of humor uh, and persisting and finding women friends that you can share your experiences with. I hope that answers the question. All right. Um, so we have another question here. Um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a name with this either, but what gives you hope about the future of women in science? It's pretty obvious that we need 100% of the brains and not uh, 49% because women essentially are 51% of the population due to being really more rugged and stronger than men surviving longer. But in any case, um, the kinds of, of um, how should I say, block that I got um, in Salts maybe when I was an undergraduate and had been accepted to medical school to everyone that I had applied to, um, but met Jack, 
my uh, spring semester of my senior year. And on our first date, uh, we essentially decided to get married. It was pretty good. And we were married two months later. And that was a happy marriage that lasted for 62 years. Um, the chairman of the department, because Jack had just come in from having served in the military. Um, I didn't want him to lose the year that he had spent in graduate study. So I went to the chairman and said, look, I'd like to defer going to medical school for a year. And I'd like to have a fellowship so that I could do a master's while Jack does a master's and then we'll go on to our, do our PhDs elsewhere. And the chairman said, we don't waste fellowships on women. Well, I don't think anybody in his right mind today uh, is going to say that. Uh, there will be challenges. They might say, well, they're all assigned, there aren't any available, but it's less overt and more covert, I guess. But it's really important, uh, I think, with the changes that have occurred, the brave, wonderful work that Nancy Hopkins, a tremendously good scientist at MIT did in the 70s, where she and just went around and measured the laboratory sizes and went to the chairman and said, look, the, the size of the women's labs are significantly smaller, the amount of resources significantly smaller, and the other women in the department, 15 out of the 16 in the department, backed her up, signed the same letter to the, to the uh, to the dean and the chair. So, and the president, Chuck Vest, Dr. Vest, said that he had thought there was some discrimination, but he didn't think it was that serious. But when he was when he was faced with the facts, he he made changes. Well, that was a his whole chapter devoted to Nancy's very brave and tipping point work. And then there's the Me Too movement, which at the time, uh, the National Academy of Sciences released a very powerful, well-documented report on the adverse effects of sexual harassment. And um, harassment that I call going from the clueless to the criminal. And changes are happening. Uh, changes are being made. The National Science Foundation will now rescind the uh, grants of anyone, man or woman, uh, involved in a harassment that's documented. And the National Academy of Sciences will rescind membership. Uh, so changes are happening. And I think in this time of COVID-19, um, there are, there's a lot of change. We're, we're changing the way we're working. Uh, I don't think we're going to go back to the way it was in December 2019. I think change, this is a turbulent time of change, and I think um, women's issues will be part of it. Shane, any others? Yes. Um, so we have a question. Um, what started you on a path to science as a youngster? I started with a great interest living by the sea. I grew up in uh, Beverly Cove, Massachusetts, a little town, or at least it used to be little. <laughs> it's now a suburb of Boston, just a block from the lighthouse. And during the summers, I would go out uh, with my dog and walk along the, the shores uh, of the Beverly Cove and developed an interest in, in uh, life or anything living. So a life scientist seemed to be a career that I would pursue. But what also happened was that my sister, who was an artist, Yolanda Fredericks, uh, married a physicist. Well, at the time I was in high school, uh, Hans Fredericks, a Dutch physicist who was on a Fulbright at Purdue University where she met him when she was teaching art 
there, he would come to the house with his physics friends and they would sit in the kitchen and over coffee and a beer, uh, would discuss their physics, their experiences as graduate students and um, as new faculty members. And it really sounded fascinating. And so that was how I at first thought that I would probably become a chemist, but I was disavowed of that pretty easily, pretty quickly uh, and turned to biology. So that's pretty much how I started out as a, as a scientist. All right, Sheila asks, can you elaborate upon the challenges that you face because of your sex? I have read that you were denied positions, et cetera. Uh, yes, uh, I think the biggest setback I had was when I had been very, very successful uh, with uh, funding. My, my mentor, John Liston, dear soul, had made me a co-PI on an NSF grant that allowed me to go to Ottawa, Canada, uh, because Jack and I had applied for National Research Council of Canada postdocs. Jack to work in physics and I to work in biology, microbiology with Norm Gibbons. Uh, we both got letters awarding us fellowships, but I got a second letter saying, sorry, uh, because of nepotism rules, where husband and wives cannot each have a fellowship. And obviously Jack was going to be the one to, to get it, which I would have, would have preferred. But John Liston um, said, oh, well, he said, well, the one way to skin a cat, he said, let's apply for a grant. So we applied to NSF. The grant was awarded. He made me co-principal investigator. I went off to Canada with my own funding. I was able to hire a technician. Um, but I think probably the biggest setback was at Georgetown, I applied for an FDA grant. It was just perfectly suited to what I was working on, uh, to study vibrios associated with food, especially shellfish and fish. Uh, Vibrio parahemolyticus, uh, I had discovered existed in the Chesapeake Bay. It was a bacterium discovered by Dr. Fujino in Japan some years earlier in the early 50s, but it had not been isolated anywhere outside of Japan until I and my graduate student uh, uh, at, George, at Georgetown isolated Vibrio uh, parahemolyticus from Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> and so this was beginning to show up as a pathogen associated with the improperly cooked seafood. I submitted the grant to the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, a team came out. Uh, John Liston happened to be asked to be on the team, which I thought was great. And they um, put me through the paces of presenting a, a talk and introducing them to the lab and to the students. And um, then they, um, went into their meeting, committee meeting. And a day or two later, I received written a notification the grant was turned down. John called me and said he was really sorry. He said he and the other members of the committee had ranked the grant extremely high. It was going to be funded, but one man, they were all men on the committee, one of the men on the committee um, didn't, didn't refuse to approve. And they asked him why, and he said he just didn't like women scientists, didn't think they were good enough. And so that was why I didn't get that $200,000 grant, which in those days would have probably been the equivalent of a half a million dollar grant today. So yes, there were setbacks, um, but all that did was make me determined that the next grant request that I submitted, the next proposal would be so good that it couldn't possibly be turned down. And I've been funded over the years by just about every agency, NSF, NIH, NSF for 17 straight years, and NIH 
uh, for almost 20 straight years by the, uh, eventually by FDA. In fact, I ended up serving on the advisory committee to the director, the administrator of the FDA. Um, and uh, I was funded by EPA, et cetera. So it's persevering, which is very important. I hope that helps answer the question. So our next question comes from Michael Wong. And they ask, um, what advice do you have for male scientists who want to help foster a more inclusive environment for our female colleagues? I think the most important advice I should give is to stand up when something is said or done that you know in your heart of hearts is not the right thing. When some, someone makes a crude comment, or is um, disparaging uh, unnecessarily, step up and say, hey, cut it out. Um, or politely say, uh, that's not what we do here. Whatever, whatever is appropriate. I think that's, that's the most important thing you can do. Speaking up and standing up for your colleagues. Also, I, I, I've had some tremendously helpful friends. I, I, one of my favorite is Buck Greeno, Dr. Greeno at Johns Hopkins University, a physician. When I was having a really tough time um, having my hypotheses accepted of the bacterium being in the environment, and we had de developed uh, an antibody test to stain a water sample that um, the stain was ligated. It was a it was a compound that would light up uh, under the UV, and so under an epifluorescent microscope, you could see whatever it attached to, and then you knew it was there. And Buck said, "Come on, let's go out um, and take some samples, and let me see what you've got." And so we put on our hip boots, went out and collected the water samples, came back to the lab. And uh, sure enough, there they were. And Buck, uh, Dr. Greeno uh, was a strong supporter despite the other colleagues who uh, did not uh, be very supportive. So I think being supportive is very, very important, particularly if the work the woman is doing is being disparaged by other colleagues for which you don't have as good a scientific uh, feeling that their science is so much better uh, if it's not. Um, and they shouldn't be making those criticisms because they're unfounded. Step up, step in, say something. All right, um, we have two more questions. Um, Oh, one just popped in here. Um, so we're this next question is from S. Delaney, and they asked, did you find yourself changing um, your communication style or techniques to achieve your goals? What te techniques worked best for you? I think um, it sounds strange in this day and age, but compromise, meeting in the middle, uh, really works very, very well. I think for women and for men, for women not to be um, um, intimidated, for men not to be intimidating, um, and to communicate sincerely, um, I think is, is probably the best way to get your message, your information across. People are really interested in science. It's really too bad especially since um, we live in such a technological environment. I mean, uh, everything we use, the laptop, the cell phones, refrigerators, cars, whatever, all comes from science and technology and engineering. And so this disparaging of science is tragic. So I think um, it's important for all of us to not try to convert people, but to understand their viewpoints and to help them understand and, and appreciate the wonders of science that we obviously do. Uh, 
it, it's very exciting to make a discovery. That's something that is shared throughout the book by other women uh, who describe the tremendous excitement at making a discovery and learning how nature works. I think it's really, really important at this time of climate change. It's pretty obvious climate's changing. It's pretty obvious we're going to have serious, more serious storms and fires and so forth. And we need to be able to work together and find a way to uh, reach a middle point. I, I think instead of berating someone who doesn't seem to see, to understand what you're trying to say, it's it's probably better to make a really concerted effort to understand understand where they're coming from and try to make the explanation uh, in a way that is understandable and provides sufficient information for the other person to come away and mull over and then come to his or her own conclusion later on. So I hope that helps. Is it that the question was a very, very important one. It's something that we really need to do much, much better, communicate much, much better today. So thank you for the question. Okay, so we have two more questions and um, I think that's all we'll have time for this evening. Um, so our next question comes from Pico and they ask, um, you mentioned some of your male mentors. Do you think it's important to have female role models as well? If so, did you have any that you remember? I had lots of them, lots of them. I just wanted to speak out, shout out for the good guys. Um, but it started with, with the principal of my, my little four room schoolhouse, which had six grades, Amy Striley, who um, uh, when a test was given, I think it must have been an IQ test. I, all I know is that she called me into her office and it scared the daylights out of me because when you got called to the office, it meant that your parents were going to hear about it, which meant double jeopardy. You were going to get scolded by the principal and probably um, uh, a good tongue lashing from your parents. But she closed the door and I thought, oh dear, this is really bad. And then she said, you have to go to college. Uh, and I said, yes, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Yes, just let me know how you can help and I'll, I'll do it. So she became one of the first early on mentors. And then there were uh, teachers in high school. There was a terrific uh, professor at Purdue, Dorothy Powelson, who was mentor to dozens of women who went on to become scientists, physicians, scholars. And then uh, there are colleagues uh, from uh, the American Society of Microbiology, uh, colleagues at the University of Maryland who are great friends and very, very supportive. And then uh, there are also women who, uh, when I was director, who we would meet uh, for dinner at the Cosmos Club um, on the third Thursday of every month. And uh, the advice was terrific. We These were women who were program managers at NIH or um, even um, uh, directors of, of, uh, of government agencies. And uh, we would just talk about the crazy things that happened that week, uh, which is a great way to, to find out that uh, you weren't alone and that uh, what we used to call the Friday afternoon at four o'clock was the the dreadful hour, the dread hour, because that was usually when some crisis would occur. A call from the Hill, uh, from a congressman or a senator who needed some information immediately or who needed to berate uh, me because the agency had done something that he, usually he, but sometimes he didn't like. So uh, yes, there were lots of women mentors and they were, they are, they remain terrific. 
All right. Uh, last question? Yes. So we have one more question, and I'll have a final question for you myself. Um, in your opinion, what are some systemic changes you support that can help uplift and support women in STEM? Very important is to introduce mathematics very early on for girls. Girls do very, very well in mathematics. And we need to get to girls in grades four, five, and six, because in grades one, two, three, they're just as enthusiastic with numbers as, as the boys. But there's a socialization that occurs and that has to change. Um, and girls need to take computer science uh, courses, a course, not, not just how to use the computer to order groceries, but to use computers to analyze data, to, to uh, think about things in a new and, and uh, very, very uh, important uh, analytical way. Uh, I love being in the Institute for Advanced Computer Studies at the University of Maryland. My colleagues, Mihai Pop and Mike Cummings and a whole bunch of just terrific people, men and women, scientists, uh, computer scientists, and colleagues in bioinformatics. Um, I think uh, not, not being dissuaded, that's another important point. Stick to it and don't give up. Don't, be, don't dare be told that you can't do science. That's totally absurd. You do it every day when you cook, that's science. Uh, <laughs> using heat to change the structure of food, science. Um, so, so I think um, if, if, you, if you like it, if you enjoy it, by all means, persevere. It's a great career. All right, so the final question I have for you, um, before we started the, the uh, talk this evening, you had mentioned to us that um, you've been working with Dr. Uh, Fauci and working on the coronavirus. Can you tell us a little bit more about that work? The work uh, I did with Dr. Fauci was during the anthrax investigation uh, in 9-11, uh, we all know it, happened, but what followed was a release of anthrax uh, spores in envelopes. I, being a microbiologist, the first microbiologist to be director of NSF, called Tony Fauci and said, we've really got to sequence that bacterium. And he agreed, he called a meeting, uh, but he was really up to his eyes and so many other things, so the way he is now, uh, that uh, there was a delay and I finally called him and said, Tony, I'll run this um, uh, committee, this program. He said, fine. And he delegated Maria, Dr. Maria Giovanni, his deputy, to represent NIH. And I ran a committee for five years. We met every Friday afternoon for an hour and we advised the CIA and the FBI, it was classified. Again, it's a chapter in the book. Uh, and we assisted in tracking down the source of the anthrax. We were not able really to uh, uh, determine unequivocally the perpetrator because the uh, suspect uh, for whom the trace was very directly going toward uh, realized that he was uh, strongly suspected and so he committed suicide the day he was to be arrested, which was very, very tragic. But currently I am working on the coronavirus because the work I have done on cholera includes using satellite sensing. Uh, this is something I started 20 years ago to measure environmental parameters like temperature and um, chlorophyll because plankton are a factor, a host for the bacteria. And so with the work of my colleague, Dr. Hock, and a brilliant postdoc who's now a tenured associate professor of engineering at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Dr. Antar Judla, um, we've perfected the, the um, 
algorithms that we employ for predicting when there will be very high risk of cholera. And the prediction model is being used by the British Aid Agency and by UNICEF. And we work with the British Meteorological Agency and with NASA. NASA has been absolutely uh, primary in uh, the support and the collab uh, collegial work. And we're able to predict four weeks in advance exactly where the highest risk of cholera will be. And the British Aid Agency is able then to uh, deploy physicians, health supplies, uh, safe water supplies to those places in Yemen. And uh, we first did that in 1918. 1917 was a ferocious epidemic. In 1918, it was much abated. And we believe strongly by being able to provide this kind of early warning. So we are in the process of modifying the algorithm for COVID-19 to be able to predict. And we've done some very interesting early studies and we'll be publishing some of that work very soon. And again, ground truth, just like in cholera, we measure the bacteria in the water itself. In this case, we're measuring wastewater and sewage and we're doing studies in Maryland uh, with the Department of Environment and collaborating with the Department of Health as well, analyzing uh, five or six locations around the state to get a good fix on the discharge of the coronavirus uh, into sewage and using that as, a, as an indicator of um, cases as an early warning system but more importantly now uh, as a trend analysis to be able to determine when the cases are going down and less virus is being shed into the system, that will be uh, support for the governor in uh, going into the uh, greater stages of opening up. So it's, it's a pretty exciting time, uh, dangerous, but scientifically interesting. We've learned so much in the last six months about this virus that hit us completely out of the blue in January this year. And so again, another shout out for science, engineering, technology, mathematics, and medicine. STEM with two M's, great place to work. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in. And I wanna thank Dr. Caldwell for being here this evening with us. If you enjoyed this event, you can find many more like it on our website, townhallseattle.org. We hope you'll consider making a donation to Town Hall Seattle as your support will allow us to continue to provide events just like this one. And if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Dr. Caldwell's book, A Lab of One's Own, One Woman's Personal Journey Through Sexism in Science, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through our, fr our friends at Third Place Books. And again, thank you all for being here this evening. Have a great night.